So we're going to jump into scripture. We're going to look briefly into the story of Jeremiah, who was a prophet that God had called to warn the people of Israel for breaking their covenant through their idolatry and their injustice. And Jeremiah correctly predicted that the nation would then fall under God's judgment through Babylon's siege and Jerusalem would eventually be destroyed. But Jeremiah was young. And God called him to be a prophet, which by no means was an easy task. It would be his responsibility to hold up an entire mirror to the entire nation of Israel to expose their unfaithfulness to God. And as you expect, uh, that we learn later on in the book, we see this hardship that Jeremiah has to go through and sharing this message is not well received. But what's so interesting from the beginning part of this story is the humanity that we see Jeremiah in and the struggle between him and God. And I don't know about you, but if I was given the task to share with an entire nation of how they have violated God's law and the impending doom of judgment that was on them, I would be anxious beyond belief. But in Jeremiah chapter 1, verses 4 through 8, it says this. Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Then Jeremiah said, Lord, I don't know how to speak, for I'm only a youth. And this is how God responded. Do not say, I am only a youth. For to all to whom I send you, you shall go. And whatever I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, declares the Lord. This story shows us that God can and often uses young people. Let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you so much for this Sabbath morning just to be able to worship and fellowship in this this place. So God, I just pray over the next few moments that you'd please just open our ears, open our hearts, and open our minds to be receptive of the word that you have for us today. We love you so much. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we've seen how God calls a young person in the Bible, and God used him mightily to prophesy to an entire nation. But church, what about today's young people? Does God still work in and through our children, our youth, and our young adults of today when it may seem as if from our hearts that we are far away from Christ? This got me thinking just a little bit more deeply about the younger generations, and I want to help define exactly who it is that we're talking about when we say young people. Uh, Starting with the eldest of young people, born between the years of 1981 and 1994, are millennials. Uh, They're also known as Generation Y. Uh, They are the most highly educated generation, receiving degrees upon degrees, championing cultural trends, and leading in spaces of technology. And with those degrees comes a lot of student debt. (laughs) The generation following uh, millennials is Generation Z or Gen Z, which is proudly my generation. Uh, They're born between the years of 1995 or 1996, depending on what sources you look at, all the way up until 2012. This generation grew up in a time where there was a rise in newer technologies, but are most notably being known for being the most outspoken and accepting generation who are a lot more cautious and less likely to experiment with drugs, alcohol, and having children at a very young age. The following generation, uh, which is the current generation of youngest people, uh, Generation Alpha or Gen A, uh, it's still a little bit too early to tell exactly how to classify them. Uh, They're the generation that's born between the years of 2013 and Um, April 27, 2024, today, 
They have most notably grown up in a time where all that they have known is technology, but also their understanding of life has been completely shaped around by the global health crisis and the pandemic. And so since we're still learning a little bit more about this generation uh, and don't have enough information to share everything uh, conclusively, I just want to share a few things that I found out about young people, Gen Z specifically, as they relate to church and ministry. So get this, uh, Gen Z wants the church to care about needs outside of the church. Gen Z wants a relevant church that speaks to today's issues. 66% of Gen Z believe that it is no longer acceptable for companies to be quiet about social justice issues. Uh, Gen Z wants a visual church. So in other words, don't just tell me the mission, but show me the mission. Uh, Gen Z wants to produce, not just consume. They want to get involved. They want to be able to give back. They want to have skin in the game. 83% of Gen Z considers their generation creative. Gen Z wants an empathetic church, a church that is relevant and seeks to understand people where they're at. Essentially, Gen Z wants to be a part of a movement that bears practical change and not a church that just simply goes through the motions. The reality in the United States is that each generation is becoming less and less religious. And how do we typically respond to this? We look down on young people, we blame them for society's problems, we openly debate their obvious faults and how we'll find ourselves eventually doomed when they inevitably reach them, uh, find themselves in positions of power. And that leaves us with more and more questions. What do we do with a generation that doesn't seem as if they're close to Christ? Maybe as a young believer, what do I do if I don't have the opportunity to make my faith my own? And what do I do if I'm passionate about something that the church doesn't place value in? And and I get it. As a fellow Gen Zer myself, if you've ever spent time with somebody in their early 20s or younger, when you listen to us, sometimes it might lead you scratching your head and a little bit more confused than maybe if we had just probably kept our mouth shut, Uh, right? We have our own language, right? Just ask any young person a simple yes or no question, and you may hear something like this. Yeah, no. No, yeah. I bet. One of these means yes, one of these means no. Which one is which? That's completely up for you to decide. Like maybe we don't get it, right? Maybe we don't understand the language or the interests of youth today. But maybe as a young person, you're wondering if your gifting and your talents are what the church even needs. But is it possible that if God was faithful with one generation, that he'll be faithful with the next With everything leading up to this point, Psalm 105 tells us, for the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness, his faithfulness continues through all generations. I'm sure Jeremiah wasn't very encouraged in the moment when he found out that he had his work cut out for him to share with an entire nation of people of their judgment, right? His first response was, but God, I'm young. How how did Jeremiah view himself? He saw himself through the lens of what he already thought, that he was young, not capable. He didn't have enough influence. Jeremiah didn't believe in himself. He feared that no one would listen to him. And if he did speak, that no one, he wouldn't even have the right words to say. Ultimately, Jeremiah had a choice. He could either listen to God and accept his assignment and trust that God actually knew what God was talking about. Or he could have simply refused that assignment and said, God, Find someone else. Find someone else. But what's so special 
what's so special about this story and how God continually reveals his love and his grace to us is that God simply says, put it in my hand and I'll do it. All I need you to do is just show up, be obedient, and I'll do the rest. Put it in my hand and I'll do it. I'll take care of it. Get this, it says this. This is how he responded. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you. Put it in my hand and I'll do it. What more could God do with our gifts if we just allow him to use them? What if we don't understand it? Right, what if we need some help to make sense of it? God, you showed up in one way this way before. Shouldn't you also be able to show up this way once again? I think that it would be completely naive to expect that one person may have the exact same experience with God and encounter with God as the next person would. Have we limited God to only showing up in one way and in one way only? Church, let me tell you about a God who created in a matter of six days. A God who caused waters to rise so that a people group could pass through. A God who manifested himself through fire in a burning bush. A God who broke down the barriers of language and added souls by the multitude. A God who called a man into heaven with him to avoid death. A God who encouraged the faith in the man of the unseen to save his household, received doubts from others until the rain started to fall. A God who created a womb to become fertile well past the age of fertility. A God who chose the youngest of a strong life lineup of brothers to lead boldly and to defeat a 10-foot man, a God who became incarnate to redeem creation back to himself, a God who used a meager lunch to feed over 5,000 people, a God who brought life back into the dead. This list could go on and on and on. God has re continually revealed to us that in moments that don't make sense, in times that don't add up, when we don't qualify, that he is faithful. He's faithful with what he's given us. His faithfulness continues throughout all generations. So yes, what God may have done for one generation is not the end all be all for time to come. God has shown his faithfulness by creating the next generation and the next generation and the next generation in all of their uniqueness. We have to realize that God is God and God can do exactly as God pleases. If we find ourselves trying to control the movement of the Spirit, we might be missing out on experiencing the fullness of what God wants to do with his church. Well, how can I do that and make sure that we still hold on to what is good and to what is true? Right? That is such a valid question. The answer to that question, it starts with empowerment, discipling the younger generation. That means talk to them. Right, make them feel like they're welcome when they're here inside these church walls. Ask them to, to share their thoughts, their opinions. What are they hopeful for? What are they expecting? How do they want to see God move in their lives? Give them a room and seat at the table in order to lead and to cast vision. I'm here today because our conference youth director and president took a chance on me and they invested in me. And young people, that means... Get curious and ask questions, right? Get curious to learn from those who have gone before you because I promise you that sometimes, yes, our challenges might look a little differently from our parents, but there is always a blessing that comes from seeking wisdom. We need young people in the church so that they can understand and be equipped to be the hands and feet of Jesus. So young people, hear me when I say this. We need you. We need your gifts. We need your talents. We need your passion. 
And I don't know what gift or what talent that God has placed within you, but I want to encourage you that you can use it for his glory. God has chosen you. He has called you. And in all honesty, you might not feel equipped. You might not feel ready. You might not feel as though that you're old enough. But even God used Jeremiah mightily. If it looks like stepping into a space and using those gifts and those talents specifically for ministry or for the church, then praise God for that. On the other hand, if it looks like you taking those gifts and those talents and using them in a secular sense so you can be a light and evangelize to others, then praise God for that as well. Let me redefine that empowerment can actually be rooted within your willingness to allow God in and to do what God wants to do. Your ability to open yourself up and to use what God has given you. You were not meant to play small. You were not intended to hide your gift. And you don't have to be a pastor to be a leader. You don't have to work directly in ministry in order to be a leader for Christ. We all have something on the inside of us that sometimes makes us feel like we're on the outside, right? But, and, I, and I get it because vulnerability sometimes can be so scary. But instead of using it as an excuse to stay on the outside, what if you use it as permission and leaned into what God wants for you? You know, that skill, that thing that you're holding on so tightly to that you're, ah, I don't know if it's cool enough, I, I'm not that good. What if that's your, your passion and your mission field in order to use, uh, to, to bring souls back to Christ? Because there's no way that God who sits on high looked down below and saw his beloved creation and as he was creating you said, I, I can't, I can't use that. No, instead, he says, that special gift, that special talent that I placed in you, I placed that in you in order for you to use it for me. And I don't know what it is for you. You know, maybe, maybe it's singing. Maybe it looks like acting. Maybe it looks like playing the drums. Whatever it is, God can use it. We've heard it once said before that the angels don't follow us into the movie theaters, right? To me, God said, I need you to make videos for the church. <laughs> oh, well, God, there really isn't a space for me to do that. <laughs> I need you to put it in my hand and trust me. My insecurity that there isn't space for me to use my God-given talents in ministry cannot stand against the power of what God has done and is doing. And it took me a while, but I now refuse to allow what I thought ministry was supposed to look like to cloud what God wants to do. So imagine... That God can use things and people that sometimes we may disregard. He can redeem anything back to himself and use it for good. Ultimately, Jeremiah was faced with a decision. He could have said no to God's call simply because he was young. But I'm so glad that he said yes. Because even though he didn't feel adequate, God still moved and revealed his love to us, for us. God still moves and he speaks today even through our young people. Why? Because God is faithful through generations. Amen. I don't know, after hearing this message, how the Spirit might be be moving. If as a young person, you're, you're hearing or sensing the voice of God to, to lean into the gifts and the talents that he's given you, I want to encourage you to step into that. 
Maybe if you're a part of the older generation, which we praise God and we thank you so much for how God has led and been faithful in your lives. If that looks like you having the opportunity to disciple a young person, I wanna encourage you to do that as well. For everyone here in this room, if it looks like, God, I just wanna wanna submit my plans to you, all the things that you have given me and equipped me with, God, I wanna go deeper and deeper with you. If that looks like stepping into a, a space to use those gifts in the church, then praise God for that, and I pray that he will lead and move in that sense. God is so faithful to us, and I pray that the Spirit will continue to move in this church. Let's pray. Dear faithful Father, Lord, we thank you so much for who you are. God, we thank you so, so much for how you have revealed throughout Scripture your love for us through the story of Jeremiah and how you moved, used him mightily. God, I just pray that if there's anything that we're holding back that we need to submit to you, Lord, I just ask that you please just allow us to surrender and surrender that to you. Father, knowing that you're the one that is in control, that you can do all things. So God, I just pray that this encouragement, Lord, would lead this next generation, Father, and that we can see a rise of young people having an opportunity to lead because, God, you know that our church is so much stronger when everyone is a part of it. We thank you so much for your faithfulness. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.